You're listening to a Sculpted Life podcast brought to you by Paltai International. Interviews with creatives around the globe. Apologies for any background noise. Often this cannot be avoided, but we hope it doesn't detract from your enjoyment of the podcast. Welcome to season two of a Sculpted Life podcast. Today we have sculptor and art teacher Amber Geneva Ercolation, originally from the Yukon Territory and now residing in Vermont. We think you'll enjoy the way Amber describes her journey in part one of this two-part episode. Um, let's start at the beginning and go back to when you first knew that you had some type of creative ability. When did you first feel that urge, I guess, to, to create? Mm, you know, um, I don't think there was ever a separate thing between living and creating when I was growing up. I grew up in an extremely rural area, mm -hmm. uh, the Yukon Territory, okay. um, out in the bush, mm -hmm. not even in town. Um, and so a huge amount of what we did to survive was make ways to live. Uh, we made a lot of our, our tools, we, we made, grew a lot of our food, all of those things are part of making. Mm -hmm. As we understand it, as, as people, we, we make things. And my, my father was a hunter and trapper, and he was good friends with a, a family of Inuit who lived locally. Um, and would take my brother and me there. And one of my earliest memories about making something, about creativity, about, about art, I guess, was sitting with Grandpa Joe, who was probably 90 at the time. And he was working on a small stone and napping it. And I asked what he was doing, what he was going to make. And he said that he was just sort of opening it up to see what was inside there already. Mm. And that's my first understanding of of creating of making is that it's not just what we put into something it's what's already there that we can bring out Ooh, I, think I, I was that. about five <laughs> but it's really lasted with me my whole life I like that and so from that first inkling in your mind about that that discovery I guess when did you start to think I could I could make I could create something? You know, again, I don't I don't know that there was a clear beginning. Um, always liked having my hands in clay. Always liked uh, uh, kind of trying to do things. And my family had really high standards. So there was my my biological father in the Yukon family, and there was my European family. Mm. Um, very old school, very German, <laughs> very particular, lots of beautiful things. And so there's this huge dichotomy in my growing up of, you know, there's this, this wild world and there's this human world, mm. you know, those were different things. Um, but what you, I guess, I guess I started getting interested in it as a, as a practice actually in college. I took a drawing class and I wasn't actually supposed to take any art classes because my grandparents were like, we don't want artists. We want wow. actual people who do stuff that matters. <laughs> uh, so I took a drawing class, um, completely failed all my other stu studies because I was just drawing all the time. I was so in love with it. Well, what, can I stop you there and ask what, in, what, how, where, where did that love come from? What was it that compelled you to keep to keep it up, to, yeah. um, to, to keep wanting to do that above all else, what, what did it give you? I think it mostly gave me a way to access areas in my mind that I don't have words for. Ooh, um, I like that. Let's just, that's just, uh, that's, that's beautiful. This, is, this wow. is something I've been working on mm. for quite some time, actually, this idea, because we have a strong sense of, we take words and we apply them to things that are unconscious, that are um, that don't have words. And when we study them, we don't 
we're trying to study wordless places. So in psychology, we talk about fight and flight and freeze. These are wordless things that actually bypass the language centers of the brain. They go directly into physical activity. Mm. And I believe that when we're making, you know, we lose track of time. We don't necessarily have words. Depends on our form. Um, but what we are doing is trying to access other wordless places like laughter, mm. like love, um, need is a wordless place, uh, desire, anger, mm. it's a huge wordless place, hope. We take these words and we apply them to the things that we feel, the, the meanings, and we create symbols through that by applying a form of communication to our inner meaning we create the symbols that we try to communicate to the world with. does that make sense that's probably yeah. one of the most poetic ways i've ever heard of <laughs> art and that that nameless um yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah. workplaces are incredibly important mm. the more that we um, the more that we look at what is unconscious in us, what is not deliberate, what is reaction and yeah. response, that is, that is how we are trying to communicate with our world. Mm. And I, I um, was listening to an interview with Sandra O, oh, the actress, mm -hmm. and she mentioned how young people are often trying to find themselves. I suspect, and I could be wrong, but I, I think that what we are trying to do when we find ourselves, when we are looking for our voice, looking for our thing, we're actually just trying to speak to ourselves clearly mm. in a hope to, if I can convey what I understand in whatever form, maybe you will try to convey your understanding back to me. Mm. And have that relationship beautiful so when you were creating I guess you felt that you were able to express yourself in in that in that wordless place in that in that space that you've that you found the flow that that it just I guess that it just was a place where you felt your expression was coming out in your art more that I was trying to connect within myself okay. with these feelings, with these intentions. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like trying to define what meaning is, what a symbol is. Uh, we talk about art and we're, we are unable to separate our daily experience of ongoing life from our, the content. Mm and the context. You know, how we live through our lives is walking the dog, is making love, is getting in an argument, is paying the bills, is going to your job. We go through our lives and all of those things are context for the content that we can work with inside of ourselves. Uh, so when we talk about trying to find your voice, trying to uh, create something meaningful, trying to make art, um, Really, we're just looking at all of the experience we have, our thinking, our ideas. What kind of symbols can we create that express our meaning clearly? And did you create such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you asked me earlier if I, if I think of myself as an artist. And I think that art has always been in my life. I don't know that I have always been living a life of art. I don't know that I've always been an artist. I've had incredibly long fallow periods, years, where I didn't make anything. Mm -hmm. um, my mentor uh, was a, in painting was Gemma Phillips, and she told me when she, about a year after she met me that she'd never met an artist with my talent that was this blocked. <laughs> I was so stuck. And it had made me really ill. Okay. Um, do you yeah. do you want to talk about that that period? 
I can I can talk about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's far enough away that I have new context and new content to to be able to look at those things through. Um, so I'd spent a huge amount of energy and time, years and years and years, trying to, I guess, be worthwhile to members of my family, to uh, other people. And it, I, I don't have a good ability to separate myself out, but I had done so very, very thoroughly. I'd separated out what I was going to do with my life and what I wanted to do with my life. Those were not the same thing, but I had relegated my own internal responses to an area that I couldn't even physically access. I just had no connections to what I wanted. So it set up this sort of um, tension in my psyche that ultimately shattered. And I had a, uh, I, I, I had a very charismatic uh, family member that everyone in the family kind of leaned in towards and did what she wanted and so on. Um, and I left her. I'm the only one who did. And it was such a massive shift that I actually had a seizure. Wow. I had a, I had a grand mal seizure. I wound up uh, working with doctors for a year. They told me that the stress was what caused it, that I'm not prone to this. It's more that um, it was my version of a heart attack. Yowzers. <laughs> we have these kind of responses to mm. what we love. We, we you know, when, when people lose uh, a favorite pet, they can grieve for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when we leave a family, uh, it can it can break us. It used to be back in the 1400s, 1500s, people who were excommunicated, the shock of that would kill them. Mm. It's well documented. It's this massive systemic shock. And I just broke <laughs> when I made that decision. Um, and that led to the massive creative block that you ultimately had from from that. The tension was actually mm. part of the creative block. Mm. That was it had been going on for some time. Um, this this family member who I'd ha- also had wonderful experiences with and lived with and and had a really strong relationship with at times, and then I just couldn't couldn't continue to uh, be what she wanted. I didn't know how. Um, and I tried. Mm-hmm. So I'd lost my art in the trying. I'd, I'd lost my creativity and my sense of meaning and my sense of personal context. Um, I'd lost the sense that I had content mm-hmm. in myself. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, I, I lost... Uh, my ability to make anything and that went on for years Uh, and then after I broke uh, my mom brought me to this class with Gemma Phillips and she Gemma worked so hard (laughs) to figure out how to unstick me (laughs) and I didn't realize that was what she was doing yeah but she had this extraordinary way of teaching so she's a printmaker Mm-hmm. and she would have all of the materials and tools out and she would have it was all adults so we would have potato chips and cheese and wine and tea and you know and everyone would go in and start painting and I was just so locked down it's like oh god they're gonna tear me apart and you know they were all just like oh there's a fragile one <laughs> tiptoe Let's, around that one <laughs> yeah, don't poke too hard Rick. You know, and so everyone was lovely, and I didn't realize that for months. It was like, oh, they actually like me. Good God. (laughs) um, Here I am being nurtured, and I don't even know it. (laughs) No, I didn't. (laughs) And Gamma would, you know, I'd make this this horrible mess of paint on whatever, and she would run it through a press, and she'd come out with this this print that was just, ugh, and to me. (laughs) 
<laughs> and she would come out with it and she would show the whole class and she would say, isn't this wonderful? Make another. And she had raised four children. So when she said, you do something, you clean your room, you eat your vegetables, you, you make do. another. <laughs> do it. <laughs> okay. She had that resonance, you know? Yeah. So I would make another and then I would make another. And then she got me working so that I was working on three or four small images at once. And she would come by and she would turn one 90 degrees and it'd be like, oh, it's different. I have to do it work now. <laughs> and so I, I just, I just went from, from like black hole vision into mm -hmm. tunnel vision, into being able to look around and say, mm, okay, maybe, maybe I can get some context now. And it just, somehow she managed to open me up. It took her months, the poor woman. <laughs> But she was uh, she was incredibly incredibly generous and that's, patient. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and I I think that's what that's what you need when when you're in that space when you no longer believe in yourself or anything that you're doing. That's when someone will appear that can that can coax you gently. It sounds like she very much coaxed you gently out of that out of that black hole and 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 gave you the the ability to look up and take those blinkers off and. Oh, okay. Maybe I can be creative again. And what was that like for you when you when you when you started having that that or or did you have that thought that oh this I'm coming out of this. This is this is something I can do. Um, you know, it's such a complicated time. I mean, this is a span of about four years. Mm. Um, so I had a year of being very very ill. Um, mm. I, you know, after that uh, that seizure event, my doctors told me that there was a 20% chance of, that I might just not wake up again. Like, I might go to bed and just not wake up in the morning. And they said yeah. the first year is the most uh, high risk. So I had that kind of hanging over me. And because mm -hmm. I didn't have a clear relationship with my family, um, and my mom was really fragile at the time too, and I couldn't really talk about this with anyone. Yeah. So sort of sat on it and thought about it. And I had to have, um, you know, breast surgery and, and various other things that happened over the course of the next two years. Mm. And so there was a lot of the, the burgeoning, the opening up that I was looking at I couldn't look at it too carefully. I couldn't. I couldn't try to define it or categorize it or put words onto it, just because it was such a, a huge amount of nameless things, wordless places that were. Uh, it, it was. It was too much to handle. You know, so I would just go in and I would say, okay, I'm going to experience the magic of mixing pale green and rich orange and I'm going to make ochre and that's what I'm going to do I'm going to make this wonderful gold mm. that to me is magic you know watching that transformation of paint colors um, and that's what that's the kind of thing that I would hold on to during this whole process if I would make 20 paintings in a week and they were all you know nine by nine and that's great but I'm not going to look at them I'm just going to go back and make some more ochre because I can't take in all of the, the issues. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. So and I've lost the thread of your question um, about creativity, about knowing when I was being creative. Was that what it was? Yeah. So when did you have that sort of inkling that you were out of the whole, you know, blinkered and you were, you were actually creating something that you were thinking, Oh, this is, this is actually good. <laughs> I could <laughs> You know, um, I had I had a couple of small moments of that because the life events were mm. so huge and had taken most of my Energy. my history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I couldn't I couldn't focus on them very much. I had um, a couple of paintings in the Fitchburg Museum in Massachusetts in a show there. Mm. Um, that was a really good feeling uh, in a curated show. I. Um, I had a wonderful artist friend in New York who looked through all my prints and bought three of them. I was like, no. you actually want to give me money for these? But, but can you trust me to, with that money? You know, it was, Does that mean I'm an artist? <laughs> and um, 
you know, and they just they just really enjoyed uh, these three these three prints, um, and it was just a, a very gradual uh, process. Mostly, it was taking in what Gemma was saying, mm. which is, "This is wonderful. Make another. Work on several at once." And listening to how she, realizing how she was teaching me was a big part of how I wanted to approach the world. Uh, these, uh, knowing how huge my own fears were, mm. I just assumed that so many other people have the same kinds of feelings. And Gemma gave me a way to approach that. Mm. She gave me a way to say, okay, I'm really nervous about this. How can I access it without paying attention to that fear, but actually just going ahead and trying it? And, you know, funny, um, I started I started teaching because I knew I could use Gemma's methods. Mm -hmm. and I had a beautiful class at uh, an uh, all-day life drawing class at the Hall Foundation in Reading, Vermont. <clears throat> and um, a number of the students in that class told me afterwards that they want to take every class I ever offer. I said, oh, great. I've got a sculpture class working in plaster, and I call it fast, cheap, and out of control. <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> it's holding on at, at the at the Ava Gallery in, mm -hmm. in New Hampshire, and I taught these people to work in plaster, and not, uh, the, the students were mostly people who had done sculpture and painting, but working in clay, working in these mediums, and... Uh, that are very time consuming, that need a lot of equipment, that are very heavy, mm. uh, working in wood, working in clay, working in metal, and in plaster, you can do these lightweight things that you can suspend them from the ceiling. You can paint them, you can stick glitter on them, you can do whatever you like. Um, and they got so excited about that, and I was really pleased. Two of my students uh, became, they, they, within the first few months of working in plaster they got museum shows was like, oh, okay Fantastic. go for it mm -hmm. and enough during that time I was able to teach I was still not able to make I mm -hmm. I was <clears throat> trying and trying to do what I was teaching them working in plaster it's lightweight it's inexpensive it's archival you know it's like all of these wonderful things Everything I tried to make was just garbage. It was just awful. I mean, there's, and you know, I've got the the graveyard of hideous sculptures out in the back. Seriously, that's like what the backyard is for. Is like just go out in the dark of night with a shovel, um, burn it. <laughs> and a uh, number of people asked me. Well, a uh, number of my students said, "Well, what can we do um, to bring these outside?" And I said, "You can't. It's plaster. The water will ru ruin it in mm. a few years." It's just for indoors. So I still remember this. January 14th, mm -hmm. uh, 2017, I believe. What are we in? 19? Yeah, 20s. Whenever it was. It was last year mm -hmm. in January 20s, 2018. Um, I googled exterior modeling compounds. And the first thing that came up was Paltaya Premium. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I'd found the Holy Grail. I read the website. I must have watched the videos like eight times each one. I, I was just wasting days like, how did she make that ear? And <laughs> wait, what did she say? Back up, back up. You know, and I, uh, I made it safe for myself. I, I did what Gemma had shown me how to make. I got this big box of, of weird cement in the mail. <laughs> and I called up my friends who had been my students and were now my friends, and I said, let's have a Paltai party. And they came over with their hot glue guns, and, <laughs> and we just made a big mess. <laughs> we were like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. What, what are you doing? Does that work? I don't know how it works. I don't know. I've got glue gun burns all over my fingers. I have some glue <laughs> gun burns. And powder everywhere, and, you know, the dog is, like, walking in it, and it's like, oh, God, what are we doing? And so we decided to start having Paltaya parties pretty much every Sunday for about four oh, months. Good. I yeah. think Brad use it. But um, I knew that this was this was a way for me to get where I wanted to go. Uh, part of my issue is that 
when I studied sculpture in, in university, I went to the School of the Art Institute Chicago mm-hmm. um, for for the second half of my school career. My first was at Bard, and that's when I found drawing, and that's when I failed my other classes and wound up having to leave because <laughs> I was just drawing all the time. <laughs> um, and uh, I've always loved working large. You know, I would yeah. build in ceramic sculpture, and I would build life-size figures. Um, I'd build in steel, and uh, so this was and, this was post um, grand mal seizure or pre. Pre, okay. University was pre. Uh, the seizure was in the end of 2008, right. so years ago. Okay. Um, and I went to school. Let's see, I graduated in 1999 mm-hmm. from School of the Art Institute. Uh, so there's this long period of being poor and trying to make things work and trying to get the equipment and trying to you know, get a studio space and then not being able to afford the materials and then not being able to meet people and have the conversations about art that I've been used to in college and and just, you know, trying to make this massive jigsaw puzzle work during that, uh, that 10 year period and just kind of not making it function well. Um, but still trying, you know, still like some of my identity is about making. Yeah. So I worked in a foundry, I built uh, custom yachts, um, I worked in uh, historic restoration, you know, fine faux finishes, uh, interior painting, just all sorts of different things that always used my hands, always used my body. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm starting to ramble. Is that a no. problem? No, 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 you're not rambling. No, it's really interesting. This is this is the whole point, right? I want to, I, I want our listeners to to really kind of understand where where that drive comes from and and what is it that can t- that keeps people creating, um, you know? Because a lot of people have that same fear as you had, where like you you had a, 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 a an event that that kind of spurred that all on and, and made you feel as if you weren't good at creating, and then you had that block, and then you know you needed that coaxed out of you. Whereas some people um, don't even begin because there's that fear is just there. And, and oftentimes it boils down to, I'm just not good enough. I made some hideous pieces and I didn't finish a lot of them. And like I said, I've got the graveyard out back um, where nobody will ever find any of them. <laughs> um, and a lot of it was also just continuing to have conversations with this community of friends that I've built, mm. uh, talking about art in a very curious and very kind way um so and asking each other questions very specific questions not just do you like this oh i like it do you like this no not really just asking really specific questions because art has really complex uh uh, relationships with itself, with each other, with society. Uh, there are so many things, you know, someone says, I know art when I see it. Mm. <laughs> How can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a boyfriend in Chicago, Dan, and he was managing a, a gallery there. And he first told me that the audience completes the artwork. Mm. The audience finishes what the artist has made. That's gorgeous. Mm. It was such an important thing to hear because I didn't know why I was making things and I didn't know who I was making them for and I'd never considered that question actually. Who am I making Mm. this for? And there is definitely an audience. An audience is necessary to see what you're doing. Um, And we can't always choose our audiences, obviously. But part of that audience is actually yourself. Hmm. So when I talk about finding your voice, um, speaking clearly to yourself, what I mean is, can you have a call and response within yourself where you say, I respond to this. And part of you says, I respond to this part. And part of you says, I no longer respond to that the same way. Like, can you have that call and response within yourself to try to speak clearly 
And can you make that? Can you make that with your hands? Mm. <laughs> and did you, and did, did you get there? I am starting to get there. You know, I'm mm -hmm. 45. I, uh, I, I, I love it. I love being older. <laughs> I, like, finally, I'm not an idiot anymore. <laughs> well, I could be, but I'm too old to care about whether I am. Um, as soon as I hit 40, it was like, man, I actually no longer care. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, really nice. <laughs> That's really nice. It's uh, it's a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, well, it's I've... very liberating, actually. It's it's like, why didn't I feel this way 20 years ago? I would have probably had such a better experience of life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think that's part of the problem, you know, that you have to go through being a twerp in yeah. order to stop being a twerp. And when you, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But so I'd gone through all of these experiences of going through college, getting into college, getting accepted as an art student and as an artist, uh, leaving school, not being able to generate a world that had what I was looking for, these um, understandings, these contexts, these conversations, this community, trying so hard to please someone who really wasn't going to be pleased with, with me no matter what leaving art in order to please this person breaking mm -hmm. because there was nothing left that I had to give and really having to recalibrate everything in the light of this illness. Um, and, um, going from there into just kind of being very unsure for a long time, mm. whether I had anything to say, whether anyone would hear it, whether anyone would notice. And now finding my teacher and being able to take her methods of teaching and bring that to others and seeing this massive response. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I talk about a lot in my classes is that um, you're not allowed to judge whether or not your piece is successful. I am the instructor. <laughs> and my responsibility as an art teacher is to make sure that you don't feel that you failed. Mm. Failure is not your job. Whether something's failed or not, that's not your job description. Your job description is to make the work. It's to create, yeah. Mm. And then we will talk about it. So take the idea of failure hand it to me, <laughs> I'll take care of that idea. I will take care of the idea of failure. You can have it back after class <laughs> if you still want it. You want it, yeah, yeah, which they probably I'm choose not to. <laughs> failure, I'm going to take the idea of does this work, does this succeed, does it fail, that is mine now, and I'm going to put it in the trunk of the car, and you can ask for it later. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a really effective thing, even with, you know, 80-year-old curmudgeonly people. They're like, fine, I will use this bright pink crayon because you told me that failure is not my concern. And it's great. <laughs> you know? And they're it, welcome to be. I think, it, be I think it, it, gives, it gives people that freedom, though, like, like what we were talking about. It gives them that kind of like, oh, well, if I don't, if it's not attached to an outcome, I'm just purely creating. There's yeah. no, there's no outcome to be had really. It's just the <laughs> act of creating, which is a really yeah. lovely way to teach because then it frees up them to just, to actually tap into that inner child, right? As well, because okay. a lot of the time we, we, we kind of put that person away and we think, oh, we, we must be an adult now, you know? And actually you've just said, no, you can, you can be childlike again. And, and I think that's where a lot of the creativity probably comes from is, is that repressed, you know, um, like when you were ill, there was probably a lot of repression of something that needed to come out of you, but that didn't have a way to come out. And now it's out. Didn't have a safe way, didn't have a safe way to come didn't out. It was still going to leak out. Yeah. But there yeah, was right. no safety in opening up that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to speak to myself clearly enough mm -hmm. to be able to create the, the dialogue where I might hear a response back that was going to be useful. Yeah. So, um, you know, you have a, 
you have an issue that you're grappling with and you're feeling really vulnerable and really tender and you're not sure and you're scared and the response is oh just thicken up your skin mm. like I didn't know how to tell people I have this serious injury and I'm terrified that I'm gonna die mm. and I didn't have a safe place to bring that out to because I didn't know what kind of response I was going to get back. But all the warning signals were there of, mm, it's not going to be the response that you want. It's going to make the injury deeper. And so I just kept it back, you know, and that was a smart thing to do. That was very much about survival. Because we wanted to keep these interviews to around a half hour mark, what we're doing is we'll have Amber's part two for you next week. But I just want to take a moment to say that some of the gems that came out for the beginning of that episode for me, and I hope for you, was about how creating gave Amber a way to access areas in her mind that she didn't have words for. I think that's a beautiful way of looking at art and creation. Um, and then it's not just what we put into something, it's what's already there that we can bring out. So watch out for part two and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that because there's more gems coming up. Paltaya Premium is the all-weather sculpting material. Add water, knead like dough, sculpt it. Make art for your garden. No firing, no molds, no kidding.